Hey, everybody. Welcome to another edition of Bike Radio. I've got Landry Bobo, the man who writes all the blogs that you read. And I asked him to come on because he has a new one that will be posted by the time we post this podcast that is extremely in-depth and something that I wish I had when I had first started training because it's going to help a lot of athletes understand why you're doing the rides that you're doing and what's happening when you're riding at different training intensities. So before we get into that, I want to mention that we've been looking and making up some routes for the Boone Grand Fondo since Landry lives in Boone. I live in Blowing Rock. They have a Grand Fondo here. We're trying to help them make some even better routes. So if you've done the Grand Fondo before, um, if they like the ones that Landry makes because he's the map wizard, we're going to be there. So if you're planning to come get registered, they're going to be awesome. And yeah, it's an amazing day, amazing weekend. It's August 6th this year. So Landry, what's the quick overview of this blog? Or I guess even more importantly, why should somebody go read the blog? To, how is it going to help them with their training? Um, I think mainly understanding the importance of why you're doing what you're doing is going to help you more to figure out your own training um, and give you confidence in your approach. Because I think, at least for me, when I when I started self-coaching, I've been on and off with coaches, but I know I self-coached myself maybe six or seven years ago. I kind of had the general concepts of what I should do, but I didn't know quite the reasons why. And so a lot of times I was questioning myself am I doing the right thing? And so just having that foundational knowledge of the physiology, physiology, physiological <laughs> systems um, is going to help you to make decisions in your training and help you to know why you would want to do a specific training over another. So mm -hmm. I think back to the videos, probably two or three years ago, years, <clears throat> excuse me, old when, Shout out to Josh Graves from upstate New York. He had emailed me or asked me somewhere. He's like, you know, I've always heard build a bigger base, <clears throat> make a bigger foundation. It's a pyramid. Da, da, da. Like, why do we ride base miles? And that's why one of our biggest videos is why ride endurance. His question started to make me think like, wait, well, what is the real answer? Like, what is happening in our body? Like, what I've heard the same things and I've been told the same things. Like, these kind of not... Just sort of like, oh, you ride base miles because that's what you do. Well, why do we do that? So I think it's a great post that you put together because it really goes in depth on all the different types of training. The number one question that I want to start with and a question that relates to endurance training, which I get the most questions about, there are athletes that might have a very short window of training and they will ask, hey, if I only have 60 minutes to ride, should I just make my endurance ride a tempo ride? Like, should I just turn the notch up a little bit? What's your thoughts? Why or why should they not do that? Yeah, I think a lot of people get too caught up in what Training Peak says and the TSS um, aspect, thinking that higher TSS or higher CTL means greater fitness. And I think that's super misleading how they they label CTL as fitness because it really isn't fitness. I think it's a good guide to quantify your overall training load, but it's not, it's not fitness. Um, and I think maybe it's training peaks calls it chronic training load, but Strava calls it fitness score. Um, but not all TSS is created equal. So, I mean, I could go out and ride as hard as possible every single day and rack up a ton of TSS, but that's not going to be better than, properly periodizing my training. So when you, the blog talks about this, but you're training, when you cross over into zone three, instead of zone two, you're training a completely different system. So it's not like riding harder is going to give you more bang for your buck. You're going to be doing something completely different. So it's, for example, it's if I was to give somebody a recovery ride and they go out and do VO2 max intervals, that's completely different. And it's no different than if I was to go from zone two and say, oh, I don't have as much time. I'm going to make this a tempo ride. The physiology, um, the physiologic response is going to change dramatically from zone two to zone three, even if it doesn't feel that different. 
what's yeah. happening in zone two and then what's happening in zone three. Yeah, I mean, the blog talks about this a little bit more. Yeah, just give us the snippet. Give us the teaser. Yeah, well, I mean, um, the main thing is we are training the type 1 aerobic muscle fibers with the lower intensity training. So if you're familiar at all with the difference between type 2 and type 1 fibers, the type 2 fibers are more powerful and they're more anaerobic. Um, and when you ride at high intensity, those are the fibers that you'll begin to recruit. When you're riding at low intensity, you're going to be recruiting more of those type one muscle fibers. Um, and those are the aerobic fibers. Those are what house the mitochondria and are what will build that aerobic base. And so when we contract those muscle fibers over and over and over again, we're training them to become more metabolically efficient. And the only way to do that is by riding at this lower intensity um, to build those type one fibers. And um, what else was I gonna say? I think that was it. But yeah, I mean, that is that is the way that you will train that aerobic base fitness. And once you cross over into tempo, you are going to begin to recruit more of those type two fibers. Um, and then the other thing that will happen is you're gonna start to transition more to carb burning rather than fat burning. So these are, both of these factors are linked with one another because the type one fibers that have a lot of mitochondria, um, because they are aerobic, they can use fat for fuel versus the type two fibers that are more anaerobically fit, they use a lot more carbs for fuel. And so when you cross over into that zone three and you begin to recruit more of those carb burning fibers, you are no longer training your fat burning capacity. Um, so you're not going to be building your endurance. Mm -hmm. Um, you're not going to be training your repeatability as much. You're not going to be, um, the other thing is also since if you burn more carbohydrates, more sugar, you're also going to produce more lactate as a result of that, because whenever you start to rely on that anaerobic system, you will produce lactate as a byproduct. And so just by riding in that zone two, you can decrease your reliance on those anaerobic systems, um, which will raise everything. It'll raise your FTP, your VO2 max. Um, it will improve your endurance, your repeatability, your ability to clear lactate. Um, the type one fibers can use lactate for fuel. So if you are in a criterium, um, you know, I, you'll get, I'll get in a lot of athletes that have very good anaerobic fitness. They come from another sport like baseball um, or something. And they've got a very, very good anaerobic system. I, I've seen people with FRCs that are like 27 and 1500 watt sprints. And that's great. That could, if you are in a good position at the end of the race, you can win the crit from that. The problem is they don't have the aerobic fitness to go along with it. So every time in a criterion, they come out of a corner or they have to sprint up a hill, they are producing a little bit more and more and more lactate. And because they don't have those trained aerobic fibers, they can't clear that lactate. Before they know it, they get 10 minutes into the race, they're hyperventilating, their legs are completely flooded with lactate and they can't, they can't pedal. So even though anaerobically sprinting out of that corner is well within their anaerobic capabilities, their ability to repeat that effort is not within their capabilities because they don't have the aerobic base to actually support that. Mm, that's awesome. Yeah. It's so important to have the aerobic fitness in nearly every uh, discipline of cycling. So that would be a good segue since we're saying, okay, keep your endurance rides to truly endurance, work on that fat oxidation. Don't be going and, you know, using the glycolytic system to create your energy when your goal is to increase your endurance and aerobic fitness. What are the benefits of riding in that, what some call a middle zone, say tempo or low threshold? Is there a time to do that? Yeah. Um, I think one of the biggest things is obviously if it's specific to your events. So it's maybe not the best way to build your aerobic base, but it is a good way to prepare for your events. So if you are training for a criterium, you probably want to do some sprint training or some anaerobic intervals. Um, you know, if you're doing 
a gravel race or a hill climb or something along those lines, you would want to do tempo or you want to do threshold intervals to prepare for the demands of that. I know for me mentally, I have to get used to if I have um, the big thing that I did in Colorado was hill climbs, which is basically you go uphill for an hour or two hours in some cases as fast as you can. And so me for me, it was a lot of a mental thing of I have to mentally get used to just grinding for an hour plus. Um, and so just as a race specific session, there is a time and a place for tempo, but those should be your intense sessions. So don't go and say I have four zone two rides and two intense sessions. Don't go and turn these zone two rides into tempo rides because you don't have enough time and then turn these two high intensity or then and keep doing these two high intensity sessions. If you're going to be doing tempo or threshold, like those are your intense sessions. Um, and then you should still have that zone two so that you're still working the aerobic base. It just depends on the time of year or your goals, your strengths and weaknesses. So the what biggest... aside, what aside from the, when you're talking about the mental side of getting used to grinding, what though would be happening physiologically when they're pushing harder on those pedals at that tempo low threshold, let's say mm -hmm. 85 to 95% FTP, like what's going on yeah. there? Yeah, that's really useful for just building muscular endurance. So mm -hmm. especially if somebody's not been training, if somebody's, for example, more anaerobically fit or just doesn't have that endurance background, I do think that tempo and threshold intervals can be really beneficial for building fatigue resistance um, mm -hmm. within those muscles. And when you ride at a higher intensity, or this is another reason why I really like low cadence training, um, is you can recruit those type two fibers, um, and train them to become stronger and more resilient. Um, and I talked th about this more in depth in the blog about the conversion of muscle fiber types, how mm -hmm. we can shift type two X fibers, which are pretty much useless for cycling into type two A fibers, which are kind of hybrid fibers that are both aerobic and anaerobic. But there is some research that supports that you can even train your type two fibers to become type one fibers as well. Um, so it's really useful for building that muscular endurance. And so in the winter, I really like to do tempo intervals at low cadence. And I think you can get so much more bang for your buck. Again, this is individual by doing tempo at low cadence because you're having to produce higher force. You're having to recruit more of your muscle fibers. So I can do three by 10 tempo at 90 RPMs. Try doing the same power at 60 RPMs and you are going to fatigue those muscles so much faster if, if that is your goal. And I think that that is the goal of tempo is going to be not so much the aerobic side of things or the metabolic side of things, but more the muscular side of things. Yeah, I would agree with that big time. And I think those people seem to always skip the cadence work and I don't prescribe a lot of it, but some of these low cadence or high torque intervals, I've always found a lot of benefit, especially too, if you're lifting heavy, you get out of the gym, go just, I, people ask me, what's the power? I say, don't worry about the power, go ride at 70 RPMs. Just go ride at 70 yards, like especially someone new, just go ride with more torque. And I, I just, the athletes that do it and do, you know, you don't have to do a crazy number of sessions. Do six to eight of them and see how you respond to it over a two block period. And I think it's a really good addition. So what do you think when we're talking about intervals, is there an appropriate time to do intervals by RPE or rate of perceived exertion and don't look at the numbers? Or are you always power, heart rate? What's the kind of breakdown there? And maybe I don't, can't remember where this fits into the blog. Um, well, I think maybe where it could fit into the blog is, is I kind of describe, I talk about the physiology of the changes that happen as you go, as you ride at higher intensities, but then that will also kind of help you to understand why you're feeling what you're feeling within your body. Mm. So I know for me, Personally, like just having a good understanding of what's actually going on in my body helps me to be more in tune with um, how hard I should be going with an interval. So I know if I'm not hyperventilating, 
then I, then regardless of how much it hurts, if I'm doing a high intensity interval or going for a KOM, I, I know that I should be able to go harder. And so if I'm not, if I'm not going any harder then it, then it's mental for mm-hmm. me. So, um, to answer your question though, you should always keep an eye on RP because your power, your heart is going to vary so much from day to day. Um, and so I think a big problem that I see people run into is they can't hit the numbers. And so they'll just stop the workout altogether. Or I've even seen, I'll give, I've give somebody recently like a VO2 max workout and they stopped the interval <laughs> two minutes in and they stopped for like a minute and then they kept pedaling just to maintain the power. And what they should have done is they should have just kept going at a lower power. Um, so in those cases, you know, power is a good thing to target, but ultimately you need to look at the goal of the session. And if the goal of the session is a VO2 max session, that's your main goal. Your main goal isn't to hit the power target. Your main goal is to hit VO2 max. Mm -hmm. Um, the power might be a good guide, but if, if you go out and you, and it feels way too easy and you don't feel like you're being challenged, go harder. Or if your power is 20 Watts lower, but it still feels, and you're, but you're suffering, you're still accomplishing the session. So keep going. So Mm -hmm. you always want to have RP as a variable in there. Um, and that's, that's also what's going to help you have those breakthrough performances, because if you're, if you're only focusing on power, I think you can hold yourself back. Um, and so you need to be in tune with how you feel. Can you go deeper than, than what the actual session is? Um, and I think that's another reason why I really like to go for KOMs on occasion is because it just allows me to like stop worrying about the power and just see what I can do. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's a really good way to get benchmarks. So mm-hmm. Great way to get benchmarks, great way to, I mean, there's, you turn yourself inside out for those things if you're really motivated by it. And yeah, I think they're really beneficial. Well, before, I actually have a question about those, but I think you made a great point about the power can hold us back because, you know, we have this target and maybe we're just on an amazing day. Um, I think also today for myself was a really good example uh, I wanted to go out. I wanted to do a workout. I had a couple like 15 to 20 minute mountain climbs. I was going to hit three of them. Wanted to do an over under workout, but I was in the mood where I wasn't, I don't think every I'm in the camp. I think, you know, a lot of people are that every workout doesn't have to be a headbanger or every interval workout doesn't have to be a headbanger. And I've definitely changed my tune to that um, from years past when I first started training. I thought, the hard day had to be like insanely hard. And so I left and I was like, you know, I've got some effort into me in me today, but I don't want to be destroyed after the first one. And part of the reason was I had to be back at a very specific time. So it was like, I need to be briskly riding. So I said, Hey, I'm going to, I want to target something like high VO two max. I'm going to let my unders, like, it would be great if I could hit X Watts, but I'm just going to see how they go. And the first set was great. The second set, the under was a little low and I was like, okay, don't freak out. Just keep hitting your overs and like you're still practicing clearing the lactate. And then a very odd thing happened. I started to feel stronger as the session went on and I just rode with that. I actually upped the under, upped the over just a little bit and then kept riding just at like what felt comfortably uncomfortable and but was never like totally dead, but was definitely breathing hard. And I think that type of session, like you're setting yourself for a, up for a win. Like I wanted to get a win today. And I think as an athlete, you need to own your, I try to empower athletes to not only follow the workouts that we give them, but own your training a little bit. It, you know, there are days we're going to post a podcast with uh, Patchy, who is the head of performance at Movistar. We had an incredible podcast together and he was just, he gives a soul ride at least once every two weeks. And his whole point was, you know, we we're out here because we love to ride our bike and we want to get better. But as an athlete, you need to take ownership at times and just say, this is the workout that I need to get done. And I, and there's a million other things going on in life. And like some days you just need to get a win on the bike, give yourself that workout that's kind of challenging, but you know, you can go do, 
And I think it's really important. Every workout should not be misses. And I think it's totally okay to fail workouts, but you know, some days you just need to get a dub and go do that. So that's, let me get off that soapbox, but I just think it's really important. Like use the RPE and go by feel and don't freak out by the numbers sometimes. Um, you mentioned KOMs. Now I know I shouldn't go for KOMs every day. And today was actually a day that I was like, oh, I should go do this workout. I was like, but I do want to try and go back and get some of those KOMs because Landry just went on like a slaughter fest. Like maybe I should go try and tackle some of those. No, I want to do the workouts because those are going to make me better. How, when should I incorporate the KOMs? Well, you know, they're fun to do. You had made the comment before they have you go deeper and set benchmarks. Where do you find putting KOMs into a plan and maybe how often should people look to do those? Um, you know, it, again, it kind of depends on what kind of system you want to train. So tell I us know, all of them, just get into it. Well, I know for me, um, you know, like last year I was doing a lot of shorter VO2 max efforts, like five to eight minutes. So I would target segments that were, around about that long and I would go and do three or four of them. And then sometimes if I still felt like I had a little more tank, maybe I would add another couple intervals. Um, obviously, if you want to do more of an anaerobic capacity workout, then pick shorter segments that are maybe 30 seconds to two minutes long. Um, if you want to train more steady state, go for longer steady state KOMs that are an hour, not an hour, you probably don't have an hour long time, but 15, 20 minutes long. Um, and I think just it depends on the time of year. So I generally don't want to hunt KOMs until I'm in good enough shape to actually get them. <laughs> um, <laughs> and then I also I think it's good maybe at the end of a training block sometimes to go and find some segments to go and target because it's just kind of a fun way to get some confidence and kind of see where you're at. Um, mm. But I think, I think the main thing is making sure that it fits into your, what system you're trying to train. And then if you're going to use it as training, just making sure that it's hard enough. So when I went and did some KOMs on Tuesday, no Friday, not even Tuesday, Friday, you know, I made it my goal to get like 40 minutes of high intensity and just as I would with an interval session. Mm -hmm. If I only did one KOM that was 10 minutes long, I don't really think that would suffice as a high intensity workout. So I think that's more guard. Like that's where athletes get sucked in. They go for one and they're like, damn, that was hard. Okay. Well, I did my KOM. I'm done. I'm like, dude, you only did 10 minutes. Like that wasn't even yeah. a workout. Now we kind of wasted that day because now I don't want you to do a hard again tomorrow. And Yeah. That's a really good point to bring up. So if you're going to use them, I guess, so if you're going to use them, use them as a hard workout day, get in, focus on the amount of time. That's what I usually try and do. Like, okay, how many am I going for? What's the total time? And are they all relatively in the same thing? Like five minutes, eight minutes, nine minutes, you know? And I, yeah, I think it's a good, I like it when I'm, when I want to train, but I just don't have intervals in me that day. I'm like, okay, yeah. let's go try and crush something. Yeah. I mean, like think about, what interval session would I normally do? And then does this, is this KOM like kind of similar to that? So actually one of the KOMs I went for on Friday ended up being exactly like one of the interval sessions that I like to do um, just about where like you go above threshold for four or five minutes and then you, you go under for about a minute and then you go back over again. And the, the KOM literally ended up being exactly like that because there's a little downhill section in there and I was like, wow, this is exactly like one of my interval sessions, but it was way more fun. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so yeah, I got that email. Thank you. Um, zone two. I had to go for it twice. I, I tried the first time and then I was like, should have gone harder at the beginning because that downhill section was like took a longer than I thought it would. Oh dang. See, okay, that's a strategy. I usually if I don't get it, I'm just I'm like, oh damn, okay, that's too hard today, and I go on. That's interesting that you got it the second day, the second time. All right, I'm gonna have to try that sometime. Let's talk about what happens on a zone two ride, in your opinion, when there's all these surges. So we've talked about zone two, we're working fat oxidation. If I'm gonna be surging and riding too much tempo, I'm gonna be 
creating energy through the glycolytic system. But are these surges that are like maybe 20 seconds, 30 seconds, I'm getting over a hill, are they that bad? What if I have five of them, 10 of them? Like, where do I know where to draw the line there? What's your thought? Um, I mean, it depends on how hard you're surging, how long you're surging, and then like how often you're surging. Okay. I think, um, I mean, if you're going full send up a hill and you're doing 600 watts, like, you you don't have to go that hard up the hill. Yeah, so that, that's like too hard. That's a full effort. Let's like I think a surge is more just like you maybe get out of the saddle a little bit. Like le- they're below threshold. Let's say. Okay. Yeah, I mean that. I mean we live in the high country, so there's obviously a lot of little steep kickers and stuff. So I think obviously you want to try to ride as steady as possible, but on occasion, if you go above, say, into tempo zone for 15 20 seconds at a time occasionally it's not going to significantly change the metabolism because the main thing that we want to avoid is those extended periods of time where we are transitioning more to the carbohydrate burning um, and starting to produce more of that lactate and if you i mean if you hit a roller or you're you're cresting a steep little hill for 10 or 15 seconds here and there it's, it's not gonna like ruin your session so i think that's another thing sometimes is I think people kind of obsess a little bit too much about the power and on the, on the endurance rides, um, especially if they live somewhere hilly and it's not exactly possible to have a completely steady ride mm-hmm. or have you been ridden with people that will ride up 10% grades at like three miles per hour. Cause they're worried about like going over this little hill, like a little bit harder. So um yeah, like a little bit of surging is is fine. You just you don't want to be doing doing it all the time. Um, and I think keep an eye on your ventilation is actually keep an eye on your ventilation is actually a really good way to to make sure that you're still in the zone. So if you begin to breathe harder mm-hmm. than what feels like a zone two effort, then that means that you're probably transitioning a little bit more into that that next zone because you are beginning to accumulate more of that lactate um because the ventilation is is exactly related to the metab the muscle metabolism so cool that's awesome i try to i've been trying to get better at paying attention to that and looking at heart rate and just trying to just just chill, man. Just ride at endurance. It's amazing what it does. And so we kind of talked about muscle fiber type and that your anaerobic fibers can become more aerobic with endurance training. That's a really good reason to do the long ride if people don't believe in the long ride. I just want to add in my own comment here. I was talking to somebody on Twitter and they said, hey, if I don't have a long event, do I even need to be doing these endurance rides and i said yes definitely like endurance is the building block of everything they said even in race season i said yes even one of the biggest things as i go through what people classic call classically call like build phases and as i get into race season i think the neglect of endurance is a problem and i'm going to speak anecdotally for myself um all my athletes know that you know we're doing two to three pure endurance rides per week, almost all year round. And the, the benefit that I see of like when I'm getting into really good form, there's always a time where I'm like, okay, things are going well. Instead of doing more, I'm going to do more endurance. And I kind of take a session away. And I think that that has probably gotten into that mindset over the past two or eh, maybe four years, I'd say. Um, I remember before I moved to Tennessee, my training was two to three very, very hard days during the week. And by middle of June, end of June, when amateur nationals would come around, I was just burnt out. Um, I felt okay, but I know there was a couple nationals where I was just a little flat and my performance wasn't that great. And I think I just overdid the building. Like you start getting the shape and you just start riding harder and you start doing more intervals. And at some point the body's like, eh, I'm good with that. And all that hard hammering is very glycolytic. So this is just 
something I think people should experiment with as you're getting fit, build that fitness. And then at some point, like, you know, I'm going to do a week of just endurance riding. I promise you, you're not going to get slower. Um, and if you need to go one day and throw in some intervals or go do a couple KOMs, like we're talking about, do it. But endurance is going to take you to the promised land. I promise you that. So my last question would be about athletes adding on more time and most athletes I don't think are looking at like yearly percentages of time and zone, but I think, you know, three to 6% would be on the higher end of like zone five and six training when combined. If an athlete adds more endurance miles and I like, I kind of forgot about this question. I didn't mean to go on my rant just before this, but like, do you think people get faster with more endurance miles and you know, what should they do if they want to add more time? Yeah, I mean, that's the, I actually have a blog I wrote for training peaks about this, but I would say for just about everybody, the the best way to improve would actually be to add more volume because once you get to those like two high intensity sessions, you're really just not going to see more benefit from doing more high intensity. Three high intensity sessions is not going to give you more than two. I think the research is pretty conclusive on that. Um, so the bet, so where can you progress is going to be volume. So obviously, um, and I think I actually brought up this example in the blog, but if you were to do the same exact interval session, say for an entire year, that your intervals are exactly the same that I did VO2 max, I did threshold and I did the same VO2 max and same threshold the whole year. But in, in one you know, in this scenario, you rode for 600 hours. In this scenario, you only rode for 300 hours. Like, obviously, you're going to be stronger if you rode for 600 hours. Mm -hmm. So you don't even need to know about the physiology. Like, it's just kind of common sense that if you ride your bike more <laughs> at endurance, you're going to get faster. Um, and actually, my one of the data points that I collected for my master's thesis was... was um, we collected their FTP and then we also looked at how much time they spent training. And there was an 80% correlation between the hours per week that they spent training and their FTP. Um, and that wasn't even looking at like their intensity distribution. That was just total time training. Hmm. Um, Sick. Well, speaking of total time training, I heard some guys at the gym today, guys said, you retired yet? He's like, I'm retired. He's like, so what are you going to do? And I was like thinking a 1200 hour year. That's, my retirement goal so hopefully i can stack some mega miles down the road uh everybody gotta check out the blog read read through the blog it's very lengthy we were thinking about releasing it in some other way and we're like we want to keep this free for people because in the videos are great and i think the like things like the why 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 ride endurance video is very helpful but this is a blog that you can bookmark that you can come back to that when you're crafting your plan for the next few months, when you're crafting your plan for the next year, when you're going into the off season, when you're just, you need to hit a reset and you need to think about what you need to accomplish. Go back to Landry's blog and there's just a lot of good information. I would definitely recommend reading a couple times because you're going to pick up something from it on the second pass through that you might've missed on the first because it get, gets dense at, at some points in a good way, but it's very readable. So any closing words, Landry, for the people? um have fun <laughs> he he stamps it with a big kaboom have fun good luck with your training if you're listening on itunes please leave us a five-star review if you're on spotify please follow youtube you know we're asking for subscribers let's try to get to five thousand. thanks so much we'll talk to you guys soon good luck see ya